You're listening to Reach MD, the channel for medical professionals. Hi, this is Dr. Ann Goldberg, president of the National Lipid Association, and I'd like to welcome you to Lipid Luminations, hosted by Dr. Larry Caskell, presented by the National Lipid Association. I'm sitting here with Dr. Alan Snyderman, who is the Edwards Professor of Cardiology at McGill University in Montreal, Canada, and he just delivered a lovely illuminating talk on apoprotein B which to me is something I deal with every day but to our listeners it may be something slightly foreign so I was wondering if you could just start with a simple explanation of what ApoB is. First of all thank you very much for that warm welcome and very kind assessment of my talk. Every atherogenic particle secreted by the liver contains one molecule of ApoB general, they come out as VLDL particles, the triglyceride-rich particles, which are then converted into the cholesterol-rich ones, LDL. But each VLDL particle has a molecule, one molecule of ApoB, and therefore every LDL particle has one molecule of ApoB. If you want to count up the total number of VLDL and LDL particles, you measure the ApoB. Why does ApoB work better than lipids at quantitating the number of particles? Because the amount of lipid in a particle can vary so substantially. In the case of the VLDL, the triglyceride-rich particles, they can have an enormous amount of triglyceride, or actually pretty little case of LDL, which are really the most important particles because 90% of the ApoB is in LDL particles, they are made up of larger cholesterol-rich LDL particles and smaller LDL particles which contain less cholesterol. But each of those LDL particles is equally atherogenic in terms of risk. Right, so we can assume that LDL is not only the enemy, that IDL and VLDL and anything that has apoprotein B in it or associated with it is atherogenic. Is that correct? That's correct, but LDL particles are the principal force to reckon with because they outnumber the other ones sure. so massively and because they're smaller than the VLDL particles, so they get in more easily. And for our listeners, HDL has no ApoB. That would have ApoA and other proteins, but no ApoB. That's correct. Okay, so when did ApoB kind of rise to the forefront? It seems like uh, that's all we're hearing about now, and it happened within the last six months. This process within the last six months started in the mid 1970s. <laughs> right, so slow and coming. Slow and coming. And because all of our ideas that count a great deal actually take a lot of time to mature, the notion of LDL cholesterol as a risk factor and the proof that lowering LDL cholesterol improved clinical outcome, that took 30 right. years to establish. So kind of like the disease process itself. It's developing, it's dormant, and then one day, boom, it's there, but it's been really kind of growing quietly for 30 years. That's correct. I've been advocating ahead of this, but it, it's taken where we are now, suddenly, the way these things happen, is that the mass of evidence so overwhelmingly favors ApoB over, say, LDL cholesterol. In my talk, I couldn't begin to review the more than 20 studies that have shown ApoB is superior to LDL cholesterol. There is simply too much data to handle in a single talk. And where that should tell us is that this, fortunately, is a contention that is over at a scientific evidence-based level. If our practice is truly evidence-based, then I would submit that the evidence is in. And ApoB is superior to LDL cholesterol because it extends our ability to truly measure 
the things that matter, the atherogenic particles. It doesn't contradict what we knew. It extends what we knew. When will an ApoB be included in a lipid panel? Why is it that we have to order it as part of a fancy battery of advanced lipid tests? If the evidence is clear, when will it be standard operating procedure? I'm a Canadian. This is your country. I can't tell you what to do in your country. You can tell us. We won't do it. And it probably makes good sense. <laughs> What's happened that really changed things, and I think has changed the dynamic of practice, is that the American Diabetes Association and the American College of Cardiology have both just issued consensus statements saying that APOB should be the preferred target to monitor the adequacy of LDL lowering therapy. This to me is a seismic shift in the weight of scientific opinion in your country. And I think that the organizations that handle reimbursement should absolutely follow the scientific recommendations of these very senior and conservative medical organizations, that if the evidence is sufficient for the American Diabetes Association, then it certainly should be sufficient for any payer of an ordinary test. And let me emphasize that the test is a simple test. So it's not that expensive. No. In my hospital, the actual cost of the reagents, because we already, all of us already own the machines, mm -hmm. the auto analyzer, is $2 a test. All right, so we can't use that as an excuse. It That's has been prohibitive. It has been used, but it isn't right. a legitimate excuse. And what about accuracy and standardization and reproducibility? All of those issues have been dealt with, and to the credit of Santika Markovina and John Albers from the University of Washington, we're in the city of Seattle now, they led a committee of the IFCC WHO in the standardization of APOB and APOA1. And so the tests are standardized. Like any assay, a laboratory has to watch its performance. But at a level of everyday clinical performance, they actually perform better than most of the lipid assays for cholesterol, triglyceride, and HDL cholesterol right. that are out there. I think you mentioned in your talk that the Friedewald calculation for LDL really is quite inaccurate and should be done four times to really get the right number. The Friedwald calculation is a surrogate. It's an estimate of the true LDL cholesterol. I don't think we should use the phrase LDL because it's LDL cholesterol, the mass of cholesterol in the LDL particles. So the gold standard was ultracentrifugation, the cholesterol isolated by the ultracentrifuge, and way back at the beginning it was clear that that was not a practical test. So this formula was developed to that approximates in a large number of people. The averages work out pretty well, but the individual variance is all over the map. And the adult treatment panel, the National Cholesterol Education Program, years ago said that to get an accurate Friedwald LDL cholesterol, you really need to do four samples to average that error out. Now, of course, nobody does it, but you can't eliminate the error by eliminating the step that's necessary to eliminate the error. The direct LDL cholesterol tests that are on the market are expensive, I think, and they have not been standardized. So, as it turns out, APOB is a more accurate, better standardized test, and the patient doesn't have to be fasting. So I can see my patients in the afternoon. Right, right. That's ideal. They love that. <laughs> <laughs> they, they don't love me, but they love that. Right. So tell me how it helps clinically. Let's say I have a patient with atherosclerotic disease, and I've been brainwashed to get their LDL down to 70, and I get it to 70, and I think I'm doing a great job, and then somehow an ApoB shows up and the ApoB is not controlled. What was I missing? What you were missing were small, cholesterol-poor LDL particles. So the LDL cholesterol is telling you, if it's accurate, that the mass of LDL cholesterol in those particles is low. 
but the number of particles can still be substantial even if you have a low amount of cholesterol per particle and we know those particles are extremely atherogenic so that is a partially treated patient we all know that with LDL lowering therapy we reduce the risk substantially but we don't come close to eliminating it and one of the reasons is that in the patients who are most at risk those with the small dense LDL we're not measuring accurately the number of atherogenic particles. And so those patients whose ApoB is still above the ADA and ACC targets, they need additional LDL-lowering therapy, statins or other drugs that lower LDL cholesterol and ApoB. Are there ever cases where you find that you have overtreated the patient and that you can back off? Yes, because just as there are individuals whose LDL particles are predominantly small with less cholesterol, there are individuals whose LDL particles are larger and contain more. So that once I have the ApoB at target, then my personal view is the patient has been adequately treated. There are even individuals whose LDL cholesterol is high or tending to be high, but whose ApoB is normal. And when you look at those individuals, they tend to be middle-aged women at low risk with low plasma triglycerides, great HDL. I think that's what a healthy lipoprotein profile looks like, not an abnormal one. And last question in your talk, you mentioned the rewards of change. Can you describe that before we go? There are multiple rewards from this kind of change. First of all, we can measure more precisely those who are at risk, so we should be able to identify risk better and institute earlier prevention. We should be able to more adequately treat patients who have established disease and reduce further the risk of subsequent events. For people who are interested in lipoprotein disorders, it allows a way of organizing and classifying them and making diagnoses in the office that were previously possible only in advanced lipid laboratories. Using cholesterol, triglycerides, and ApoB, we can make this possible. Well, on that note, Alan Snyderman of McGill University, thank you very much for talking with me. Thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity to talk to your audience. Thank you for listening to Lipid Illuminations, presented by the National Lipid Association. For more information, please visit www.lipid.org. Reach MD, the channel for medical professionals.